Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending September 21st. First up, this was sent in by Navy Thomas 8. Thank you for sending this. This is a video by Captain Dave Sippler. And if you have a chance, if you have a GoPro camera um, and you've been using desiccant packs to keep the camera from fogging, this is a different way you can possibly do it. It's using Rain-X anti-fog, both the interior and the exterior anti-fog compound, and he shows how he applies it to the camera. This could possibly work for other cameras with a similar type of cases too, but as always, be cautious and probably use it in an unobtrusive area first before you actually try it. But he uh, uses these cameras on a regular, he's a charter fisherman and he uses these cameras on a regular basis to film underwater scenes and it's always worked for him excellent he says so he's got the experience and take a look at his video about how he does it and uh, I think he does a very good job of showing it. Next up this is a scientific paper that I found myself usually scientific papers are pretty dry and most people don't want to read it but these papers um, are very readable this is by some scientists in Sydney Australia it's called mass extinction in the structure of the Milky Way what these scientists do is they propose that every time a mass extinction or the majority of the time mass extinction events have happened it's been during the time periods where our sun has actually passed through the spiral arms of the galaxy I've talked about it before the fact that the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy aren't stars turning around it's actually a, a compression wave and it's different stars all the time this compression wave goes around so pretty much all of the stars in the Milky Way at one time or another end up in the spiral arms along with obviously our Sun and uh, what the interesting thing about this is because of they believe that most if not all mass extinction events are caused by um, the passages through the spiral arms they are proposing that one of them that was not accounted for because we don't know the structure of the spiral arms on the far side of our galaxy it could be that they've actually found the new structure either a spur or a small spiral arm <coughs> if you take a look at this picture I'm gonna put up here to the left is the spiral arms as far as what we know from surveys we've done of what the Milky Way looks like and then to the right is what uh, these scientists propose could be an extra feature in our Milky Way galaxy just because of the fact that it may coincide with one of the uh, mass extinction events that has happened and then if you notice in the bottom the yellow dot that's the uh, position that our Sun is in right now where uh, because of the fact we are entering a small spiral arm right now um, who knows what this is going to mean? Is it going to mean we're going to be subject to more impacts? I mean, we're still talking about um, a scale of time that is very, very long, so it's not like anybody needs to panic because we're entering a spiral arm right now, but it does just mean that the amount of impacts is going to increase, and that's going to be caused by the fact of the gravitational um, waves of passing through the spiral arms and also having more stars close to us knocking material out of the Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is material that is very loosely gravitationally bound to the Sun and anything passing close to us and uh, by close it can still be very very far away in terms of distance but close enough to affect it um, the, uh, to have gravitational effects can actually knock things out of the Oort cloud and they'll either move away from the Sun or go into orbit around the Sun so those events just seem to happen more frequently during the time we are in the spiral arms which does seem to make some sense so if you get a chance it's a very good article you don't have to even read the whole thing you could skip around but <coughs> excuse me I think the article is very well worth the read and it's it's an easy read for most scientific compared to most scientific articles and uh, these next two were sent in by 1954 shadow this is uh, from Gizmodo and it's entitled the aluminum airship of the future has finally flown um, after the Hindenburg disaster it's been kind of hard to get any kind of uh, company to invest in any kind of rigid airships well the AeroCorp has and as a matter of fact they've even built a half scale of the model they propose the model of the airship they propose and this is kind of a cool looking structure I'll put some pictures up here um, the model that they've uh, proposed is going to lift 66 tons now they're they're flying a half scale model and they may even in the future look to building if this is fairly successful and they may even get military contracts out of this for heavy lifting and things like this the uh, future model they propose may be able to lift up to 250 tons and even another one that can lift 500 tons um, they uh, may even talk they talked about if it if uh, if it gets popular there, there could even be the possibility of making them into giant floating hotels so that it's kinda cool maybe we'll see some more rigid airships flying around in the air in the future and last up this is called 
thinnest glass, as it's from science now, thinnest glass ever is just two atoms thick. Does it shatter? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, the scientist that created this glass said it bends pretty well, a lot better than normal glass, but it does eventually shatter. And uh, this was actually a mistake in a scientific experiment. This uh, scientist, David Mueller, was making graphene, which I've talked about that before. It's just sheets of uh, very thin carbon. And uh, for somehow the experiment became contaminated, they think, with oxygen. And silicone somehow reacted in the experiment and created very, very thin sheets of glass. And this is unusual because the scientists have never had super thin sheets of glass, um, two atoms thick before to work with. So when they found out what they had created, they gave it to another scientist to examine under an electron microscope. And if you look at the picture here, um, to the left is what the structure was proposed to be. And this was uh, a scientist called W.H. Zachariasen that proposed that... Uh, what he, what he thought was that glass would look much like, the atomic structure would look much like liquids frozen in time. And you'll see on the left is the proposed structure, and on the right is the actual scan with the electronic microscope of what the structure looks like, and it seems like he really nailed it. I mean, they said basically it looked like, when they looked at the structure, it looked just like the drawing that uh, Zachariasen proposed. So that is kind of cool. And uh, uh, I say a lot of times a scientific uh, experiment that has a mistake in it sometimes doesn't end up being a mistake. It ends up being a breakthrough or something we haven't um, found out before. In this case, it actually confirmed the model that another scientist proposed for the structure of glass. Also, they said that um, the effects of being able to produce ultra-thin glass like this might actually help us in the future with semiconductors and things like that, uh, make a lot of our technical gadgets um, either better or more effective. So um, it's cool when things like that happen in science. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.